Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and today on Mages, Sages and Seers, I'm proud to bring you Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein, the Enchantress. Greetings, Barbara. How are you? Greetings, Hercules. I am good. I'm very good. I am pleased to be here. And uh, we always have a good talk, whether we think we're going to or not. We usually do. So I'm anticipating that. And I thought it would be nice to um, talk about self-esteem and resiliency. That's awesome. They are very important aspects to our lives. And uh, without some degree of self-esteem, some sense of self-worth, and without some capacity to control or come back from the episodes, episodes that pull us down, we would be in serious trouble. And most of us have known somebody over our lives that unfortunately didn't have good resiliency and it can result in people taking up addictive products and all sorts of things. Um, I think that resiliency is um, partly DNA related, but plenty of it is learned behavior. So I don't think, I don't think we have to worry, did I inherit you know, enough resiliency. The What we have to worry about is how do we bring up our kids so that they have enough resiliency? Forget, forget the DNA, there's gonna be enough there. What the danger is, is that in raising kids and living complicated, difficult lives, lives that often are parents who are struggling themselves, perhaps it's not a good marriage, perhaps there isn't enough money, perhaps someone's sick. And at the same time, maybe you have a four-year-old or a six-year-old, you know, and those days come and go. And when they're gone, if there are a lot of mistakes that have been made, sometimes it's the child that suffers for the mistakes. So it is very important that parents understand that they can help their kids with resiliency. They can help them by recognizing as best as parents can, and usually parents are good at this, recognizing their child's talents and strengths and even potential. In other words, the kid is taking let's say piano lessons at age six or the drums, and they can get a feeling like, mm, he's probably not gonna wanna take it after this year because he really stinks, you know? Or the parents may be feeling, my God, he's got a lot of talent. Let's make sure we can keep paying for this. But usually the parents are pretty accurate because they know their own kids. So it's very important for parents to be able to help a kid get out of something if it really wasn't suitable, such as maybe playing an instrument or uh, even a team sport that just isn't working for that kid, but also to recognize potential talents. You know, this kid has a stamp collection that's amazing for an eight-year-old. Well, that means something. That means that kid could be a really good accountant someday. He could really be good tied into other assets of um, monies and architecture and all sorts of things that come out of having a, a feel for tiny objects and what they're worth and so on. So parents do remain the front lines of helping a kid stay with talents, give up perhaps things that are not worth pursuing, 
and helping the kid when he falls off the wagon because no matter what the talent is, let's say he's uh, he, he's playing the violin, uh, well, he probably shouldn't have tried to slide down the staircase sitting on the case of the uh -huh. violin. And now it's going to cost $300 to get another small violin. He's only, you know, he doesn't need a Stradivarius yet. And the parents are furious. But these are also complications that the parents hopefully have the courage and the strength to not be so dominant and so upset that a talent is lost. You know, it happened. It's it's not good, but it happened. And the violin can be replaced or rented if there's no money to buy one. Whatever, there should be, you know, an effort if that appeared to be a real talent. Doesn't mean that the kid may not lose a little bit of allowance or have an extra chore sweeping the kitchen after supper. But, oh, you know, that's that's one level of minor recognition and punishment. It's another level to say someone has to stop something or or to really, uh, you know, be mean in a way that's not going to be helpful. So parents, as I said, they always stay the, in the front lines. And um, I don't know, uh, I'll stop at this point and ask if, uh, if for you, growing up, um, resiliency, whether you knew the word or not, are you aware growing up that you may have experienced some of this rock and roll between um, stuff that you weren't really good at and stuff you were really good at? You know, I'd be interested. Uh, kind of yes and no. I was fortunate in that my parents pushed me in a bunch of different directions to see what I would be good at. Um, and uh, like in most uh, families, uh, what you see is uh, great uh, is not seen as great. <laughs> uh, even though my my mother especially wanted me to uh, learn acting and you know composing, writing things, and so forth. Um, when I had opportunities that came fairly early in my life to do something with that, uh, my parents tried to talk me out of it, you know, and uh, instead of uh, following the creative news, I was encouraged to do more realistic things. So in retrospect, it, it doesn't really make sense. I had Prentice Hall interested in publishing my writings, and I was still in high school. And uh, yet they thought that uh, that was too uh, uh, unpredictable thing that it's better off if I like did something realistic, like work in the supermarket or in a grocery store. So I asked them as an adult, what was in your head? Prentice Hall <laughs> was interested in my writings when I was a, a teenager. Oh, you know, in case it didn't uh, turn out the way you thought you might be heard. And much of life doesn't turn out the way you think. Uh, and that's where resiliency comes in. You know, you get knocked down, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you move on. And uh, sometimes you won't know what you want to do until you've done it. Like um, in uh, New York City and in other places, I used to create student intern programs for the human services and for other uh, professions. So a lot of times we get kids from community colleges or uh, four-year colleges, and uh, they wanted to get into the human services. So I, I was working mostly during the time in the hospital. So I could put them in inpatient units and outpatient units and places like uh, that so they'd get a pretty round uh, experience. And some of them would see after a while that this isn't really for them. And uh, we would talk about that in supervision and I would congratulate them that uh, a lot of people don't have the courage to recognize that the path they're on is wrong uh, and that they actually have the opportunity to, to explore new paths while they're in college. So that's a lot better than... Uh, graduating is something you that doesn't really thrill you or doesn't really excite you. And then years pass and you're still stuck with doing that because that's what you got your degree in and that's what you have your experience in. And that is true of a lot of people I've encountered in my journey through the human services as well. So sometimes they found their path and they knew it 
and sometimes they found something that wasn't their path and they knew it. But that knowing was worth uh, all the travail that it took them to get to that point of realization. Yes. Well, you bring up an important point that as we grow up, as the years go by, less and less often should we be depending on parents to support the resiliency, nor nor are they probably bothering to do so as they move on with chores and, you know, maybe other kids and health and all sorts of things. And that one of the gifts we have as an adult is recognizing what's good for us and what isn't and having the resiliency to move away from something that isn't really that good and um, stick with things that really are, that do seem very suitable. And um, that's just um, something to keep working on our really our entire lives. And it's very tricky because we have a lot of little, for lack of a better word, I'll, I'll pull something that sort of uh, they talk about in some of the religions of, the, little, the angels that sit on your shoulder, the good... Uh -huh, yes. Yeah. And, and really, you know, we often fool ourselves because some little angel is sitting there and saying, hey, what's the big deal? Of course you can go skiing. The fact that you gained 40 pounds and didn't do anything for three years means nothing. Go out and get your ski equipment. Get on that hill and go for it, kid. You know, when the kid, the kid who's now 45 comes home with a broken ankle, of course, you know, not just poor reasoning, poor, you know, thought. Uh, we have to let certain things slide by the wayside as we grow older and not convince ourselves on certain things if we can't be um, have the energy or the time, the money, whatever it is. And uh, we do have tricks within ourselves. So we we do become complicated, very complicated creatures. And um, very true. I can see you're thinking of a thought, I can tell. Yes. Yeah, that, it, that life is always, uh, um, it, it's a process of learning and a process of revision. And I think that's where the resilience comes in. Uh, you, when you do things and they become habitual, uh, that's fine as long as your life remains static. But life so seldom remains static and there's always a curveball or a fork in the road or the road disappears and there's a cliff. So you, you have to figure out what to do. Um, somebody wrote a book called uh, Who Stole My Cheese? Yes, yes. It was a it was a very popular business book, and generally was saying that you know if your cheese is missing, you have to go seeking out new cheese. And then somebody else wrote a book that was in part a refutation, in part a parody of that book, and it was called "I Stole Your Cheese." <laughs> and uh, there they 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 said that you know life is not always going to work the same way. So it's not just a matter of picking up and doing the same thing you were doing but now somewhere else, sometimes you need to not look for cheese. You need to look for something different because you're not at the same cheese seeking point in your life. And the world that created that paradigm is no longer available. So you have to come up with something new. And uh, again, I resist change like everybody, but there's also an excitement now when things are changing. And I see it as an opportunity to do something new or to be somehow new in my outlook or you know to learn new skills or uh, whatever to re redefine myself a little bit, and it, it's not no longer a bad thing. No, it isn't, and and to not have to to not have too much shame around new things or changes can also be very helpful, you know, because um, if we have too much embarrassment, often we can't move forward around something because it's just, you know, suffering that embarrassment is difficult. But um, everybody has things that go wrong and things that break down and things that don't work out. And 
it's hard to remember that when, you know, if you're in the middle of something yourself. But um, I know for my mother, she was very, very good at acclimating to the different stages of life. Mm -hmm. Hope very much that I inherited or again, uh, witnessed enough to have some of that too. And um, a funny story is coming to my mind that's in her little book of feel good stories and the, just to show it, I'm not trying to push it on anyone. I'm just so proud of my mother that at uh, finally at 83, she pulled together these stories um, to make a book from early childhood to senior citizen days. And, and one of the stories, I mean, these are not, you know, big deal things. These are the things that happen in life. But her resiliency always showed through. One of them was that after my father died, she still liked to go to synagogue once in a while and pray and say hello to the rabbi and whatever. And she drove, still was driving a little bit. She would drive herself there. And on this particular holiday, somehow when she went into the ladies' room, she did something with the lock and she couldn't get out of the stall. Mm. And it was, you know, kind of disturbing. And of course, eventually a janitor or someone would have found her, but you know, nobody wants to um, stay in a stall for six, seven, eight hours, you know. And um, so she finally looked through her pocketbook a little bit and found a comb. And with untapped resiliency, because she had never done this before, she got the lock to move, you know, with one of the little prongs from the comb. Now, it's not a big deal. It's not like she kept a house from burning or something. But again, it's that ability to grasp onto resiliency, not panic, just, you know, how can I get out of this little spot I'm in? And that's part of resiliency also. Yes, definitely. And uh, and again, you sometimes discover exciting new things about yourself you didn't know. Like uh, um, I had wanted to uh, get published uh, my writings. And uh, throughout the years, I've written articles for various uh, magazines, sometimes local magazines, sometimes with a bit bigger circulation, uh, but nothing really to write uh, home about. Um, one of my articles got noticed by May Eisenberg, and that led to the adventure on which I met you. And then we adventured together for many years. We're still adventuring now. Uh, so uh, somebody suggested to me, one of the authors I interviewed on my podcast, why don't you write for anthologies? So I never thought of that, even though I like reading anthologies. So I started submitting things to anthologies, and now I've been published in over 20 anthologies. Wow. I have an Amazon page, and uh, I'm on Goodreads, and uh, and I'm considered by, even though I haven't written my book yet, uh, I'm considered a prolific author. And one of my publishers wrote some really nice words about my writing and put it on a web page. So I was uh, very proud of that. Uh, and now it's it's routine to be writing for <laughs> for those things. But before it was something uh, that was too big for me to even contemplate doing. You know, I was fixated on a particular idea and, and what I should do. And now, you know, I found that I don't have to publish books, although I still want to. Uh, I could publish uh, anthology chapters. And uh, the, the, there you go. I'm out there. People heard of me. And uh um, I, I, again, all that internet recognition. So um, I never would have thought of that till somebody suggested it and it makes sense. And, but until that moment, it, it wouldn't enter my brain. That's right. I had a similar thing happen uh, in terms of um, writing. When I was writing my first book, The Enchanted Self of Positive Therapy, at times, it was very wearisome to, very difficult to make all the notes that I needed to make. And I was collecting different case studies from my clients. And I had, I felt I had to write all that stuff down. I had to keep it somehow sorted so I could get back to it. 
And um, there was a psychologist that I was friendly with and we often chatted. And she said, well, why don't you just use your little dictaphone and catch a lot of this stuff? You know, and it'll be, you won't feel the pressure that you have to type it or, or find someone to type it. You know, um, mm -hmm. let, let your secretary, if she has time, just get this stuff so that it's available. Because some of it I would never use. You know, when you're doing something new, you do a lot of extra stuff. Yes. But you don't want to lose it either at that point. You know, and um, so I did. I did a lot of dictating. And it was very helpful. And since I was paying someone else who was actually not a psychologist, she was a social worker who had done a lot of editing. She was looking over my stuff before it went back to the publisher who would do the final editing. And so um, to have her do a typing um, made an awful lot of sense and took a lot of stress off of me because I'm a pretty good talker. I can catch most of what I want to say, you sure. know, talking. So, yeah. Yeah, there's so many little things that we can change and do. And very often we have to be willing to acknowledge that someone else gave us the idea, you know? Not that we have to write about it or even give them money or anything, but just it's an attitude. It's an attitude that information and helpfulness can come in from the universe and we don't have to create all of it. No, and sometimes some I'm, I'm a big fan and student of synchronicities. And last time we had a, a show and we were talking, I had a memory that I hadn't thought about in a very long time. But some connection happened before we even met because when I first had the idea of doing a television show, um, I was asking myself, well, who would I have as a guest? So I went to the bookstore and I was looking at the psychology books, the metaphysical books, the self-help books, and I came across the enchanted self. Wow. So I wrote down the enchanted self, I wrote on the publisher, you know, your name oh. and all that in the notebook. And then I put it back on the shelves and I went to a few other bo bookstores. So I forgot all about that because I do different exercises every day just to, you know, organize my mind and see what the best way might be for me to proceed. And uh, I remember that on our last show, but I had put that down maybe a year or two before um, I was on May's show that led to my own show. So something in the universe made me pick out your book and write down your your name um, and the publisher uh, that all that time before. And then I've forgotten it until very recently. So th that was a phenomenal synchronicity. That was amazing. That's that's really I love that. I have not heard that before, you know, so now I I'm going to hold on to that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I do think that with certain important things, we get three or four or five different signals that mm -hmm. something's coming, something's coming. And we don't really um, necessarily put them together. Maybe we don't even internalize some of them. So that's why there has to be more than one sometimes. I, I have a recent example to give to people uh, that... Um... Atlas, who held the world on his shoulders or the sky, depending on which version of the myth that you read, that has been popping up in my life. And in, in the story with Hercules and Atlas, um, the, Hercules is sent to get the golden apples of the Asperides, and he can't get them for some reason. So Atlas can get them because his daughters were the Asperides. So Atlas convinces Hercules to bear his burden of the sky um, or the earth and go get the apple. So Hercules agrees. And then Atlas goes and gets the apple and returns them. But now he's been freed from his burden. So he doesn't want to take up this burden again. So he's trying to converse, uh, trying to convince Hercules to keep the, the task. So Hercules doesn't want to get stuck. So he says, okay, I'll, I'll gladly do that. 
But first, let me rearrange my lion skin because the, the earth or the sky, depending on which version, chafes. So Atlas said, okay. And he took back up the bird in the sky. And of course, Hercules took the apples and left. And it seems cruel, but it, it's a lesson against assuming burdens that are not your own. That all of us, especially if you're in a helping profession or you want to help people, you take on burdens a lot of times that aren't yours to take. And then you can't let go of them and you get stuck with them. So all of a sudden you're responsible for something that is not your task. Right. So Atlas has been come the stories about Atlas, people have been sending pictures about Atlas. And today I, I had uh, a personal message on Facebook from a friend I hadn't talked to in months and I haven't seen in like a decade or no, like more than two decades. Uh, and she sent me a picture of Atlas. So the universe is creating, reinforcing the story. Um, so I'm starting to look at what in my life is something that isn't my burden. You know, what What am I carrying around that maybe uh, it's time to let go of it? It's not mine. I shouldn't assume the burden for this thing. And again, it's difficult because I've been in the helping professions my whole professional life. And uh, before then, I was a deep trance medium. So I tried to help people with that. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm surprised by how many burdens aren't mine that I've been carrying. So now I'm slowly starting to let them go. That is so fascinating. Yeah, I have had patients over the years that have tortured me. Of course, I never told them I couldn't. Mm -hmm. but because I wasn't quick on the uptake of, you know, how repetitive certain behaviors were, you know, that they would not be moving ahead for various reasons and so on. And, um, it's okay to have patients like that if you're comfortable with it and you know how to um, make clear what you'll carry and what you won't, that's fine. But it takes some, you know, for most people, it's it's tough, but it takes a lot of uh, time with uh, a mentor or a much more seasoned uh, person in your field to often get to those levels, you know, where um, you can be holding extra stuff and it's not, it's not intruding. Mm -hmm. And um, usually by the time that happens, at least for me, I can see, you know, the years have gone by so quickly that um, I at this point in my life, only one, a very small practice. And um, it's sort of, it's sort of sad in a way, you know, when, when clinicians are really uh, very skilled, they're retiring or, you know, writing books or doing philosophy or knitting, you know, <laughs> it's, life goes on. Like you're saying, you go through different stages, you know, in, in the type of work we do. And um, I, I would say that another form of resiliency for me, which is probably somewhat universal, is recognizing that certain types of uh, clients are best served by someone who's right right on the spot with a particular type of training at this point and so on. And for me, I still feel that I am at the foot foothills of, uh, that's interesting, I never use that word. It's okay, but I wonder why I used it. Um, the foothills of the next adventures in my life which I believe include uh, uh, books, definitely, but perhaps books in uh, other forms in the sense of books that are listened to rather than always read. I'm very much in favor of listening. I love to listen to reading material, and mm -hmm. I'd love to see some of my works as written as in that form. And uh, 
I see myself as making more films, maybe. It's interesting because um, I'm just not sure. I don't know on that. I feel for sure I'll be continuing as, as a writer. Um, so I have to look more for signals that are coming into my life. Um, and definitely the days of being a full-time therapist, they've passed into eternity. They're done. They're done. But right now, a very small practice is okay. It's lovely if somebody out of the past calls. Very seldom does that happen. You know, one of the disadvantages of being a clinician is you don't usually hear from people. When you leave, they leave you, mm -hmm. they, they're gone. Who would want to stay with you? <laughs> it's different than a teacher. With a teacher, you may have people stopping in for 30 years, you know, as long as you, whatever. People love to come back. So it's a different type of work. And um, I think the aging process is also, I think the aging process is very strenuous on the yes. therapist. And I think that's an area that has not been explored. I think that most people who become clinicians think they're very talented at it, want to do it, they're very sincere, and they are not as good at recognizing their own fatigue and um, downsides. And this brings, this can bring problems later in life. Um, yes, I've talked about it a little bit, but I don't think there's been enough written or, or talked about. That, that's very true. Uh, and uh... Um, I left uh, the profession uh, a couple of uh, decades ago, even though I still keep in, like right now I'm on the um, Access for All committee, I'm on the Stigma Free committee, you know, so I'm on committees that have to do with uh, mental health in uh, the community, but I don't uh, really practice anymore. I haven't for a very long time um, because the understanding came to me working with uh, practitioners, with clinicians, is that we start this path because there's something wrong in our family life or in our lives, or there's something we don't understand about ourselves or someone very close to us. So we go to school, we get the degree, uh, we get the licenses and certificates, we're hired, so we're validated. Now we can go on and heal. And we do that for many years. And the realization comes after many years, that the original problem that put you into the position that you're in hasn't resolved itself. So you haven't been able to solve that original problem, like the your sibling is a substance abuser, or your parents are alcoholics and abusive, or whatever situation drove you to try to study the mind and to understand yourself uh, hasn't resolved itself, despite all your education and all the good work you've done with uh, other people. And you start to see that the areas that you've been focusing on specializing in also have something to do with that original impulse. So you become aware of how much of your journey had to do with you personally and uh, how much it had to do with people in your family or people who are very uh, close to you. The ancient Greeks believed that the, the therapeuti, or the, which means a tender of an altar, the, uh, it, it, he's part of a journey or she's part of a journey. So the healer is half the journey and the patient is the other half, a journey, half the journey. And the journey is one that they take together for healing to take place, both of the person seeking the healing and the person providing the healing. So it was kind of like that understanding, but really personalized. And um, also during my journey, there were several therapists I've worked with who committed suicide, some of them spectacularly which was, of course, very disturbing to the patients of those therapists. And the institutions had to, like hospitals, had to deal with uh, that. 
but um, I, I, I just saw the journey for what it was, and I got my answers that I was seeking out of it. And it became okay that I can't solve the the problems of the world, you know, that I did the best I can. Uh, and sometimes I'd encounter people years later and somebody who I put a lot of work into hadn't made any improvement at all. And then somebody that I just did the minimal, according to what I thought, I significantly changed their lives. And they talked about the significant uh, impact that I had on uh, their existence. And I couldn't remember it, you know, or I remembered it and it, in my mind, it wasn't that, that big a deal what I did. It was just standard stuff. So I began to realize very many things that I was blind to before while I was on the path. Yes, yes, yes. I remember uh, so many things that are, you know, synchronized with what you're saying. And um, I remember a patient I worked very hard with, uh, felt tremendous, I'd say normal, but significant attachment. I was really on this person's side, you know, for a long time. And the person never even came to the last session. You know, I'm not saying that was bad or good, just the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say that... Um, Oh, there was something else that just floated out around uh, the patients. Um, it did just float out. I guess I'm not supposed to know that one yet. That's how I interpret that, too. And but, when that happens, it's like, maybe it's not the time. I'll just wait. Uh, and... Yeah. But um, I know for myself that... Um, Many of the things you said ring very, very clear. And um, I think I lost, what I lost during the mid-years, I can't get all of it back. What I lost physically was I sat too much. And that's just not healthy. Everything I read says, you know, walk, walk. Even if you're not going to pick up uh, something to help with your weight and all this stuff, walk. Mm -hmm. You know, the human body recovers and handles itself better if you move around. And I had limited stuff. I mean, of course, I, you know, had children and I lived in a house and had a husband and I cleaned the cleaned the you know, the dishes, and I ran the laundry, and yeah, you know, I did normal stuff. Uh -huh. But sitting eight or nine hours a day was a mistake. A big mistake. <laughs> I'm still paying for it. Um, so things like that, just decisions that go with a particular profession. Now, there are many therapists that are long-distance runners. They've built it in. Right. No, it just wasn't in my particular capacities. I needed gentle types of exercise, more like a walk, more like a stretch. I wasn't geared for running and, you know, high intensity stuff like that. Um, so there are a lot of things that uh, I lost out on. And when all my girlfriends were doing things like belonging to clubs and maybe even playing canasta if they were uh, so inclined, I was seeing patients. And I think that another thing that I lost was some of the ease of being with girlfriends um, because every stage of life has its dialogue and has its... Yes rules and regs, you know, and um, yeah, you know, there's no uh, going back on certain things. And uh, fortunately, some of my college girlfriends have, thank God, are alive and relatively well. And there's so much rich attachment there because we went through such important stages of life when you're in college, you know, that, that that's been 
an extremely meaningful part of my uh, aging is staying in touch with these women. And we were, I was just on the phone with one of them before we got together a couple hours earlier. And she was just a delight. I love her to this day. Her parents were, you want to know why she was a delight? Her parents were a delight. Uh -huh. Now, here's my situation. I was transferring to Barnard as she was transferring. And I, it was the first week of school. My parents could not bring me to college in New York City. My father was a superintendent of schools and he was out almost every night with meetings. My mother was a teacher and also 17 years after I was born had a new baby. Wow. She was unbelievably busy even with uh having a maid many times but still just keeping her job keeping you know doing doing things for the baby that no one else could do that kind of thing so i had to take the train all by myself with two suitcases that didn't roll in those days <laughs> you held your suitcase and I had to take the train to 125th Street and then a taxi and go to my dorm. Well, this other gal, her parents had brought her. They had a big hamster full of food. They had paint because they were painting her room. It was, you know, like paradise when I saw what was going on. And they were such sweet people. They wouldn't leave me alone. They shared the basket with me, the food, and they insisted on painting my room. You know, they were just nice human beings. And um, it was a good start to the transfer. But I think when parents can't do things for kids, there's a loss, you know. Yeah. So it was, there was some degree of loss that um, probably fits into my diagram of who I am. But anyway, uh, I spoke to this gal at five o'clock today and we were laughing and remembering her parents painting the rooms. And, you know, it stays as part of the circle of life that's really good. Yes, it is. I'm glad you had that, Barbara. That's a great thing to have in your life. Yes, I'm glad I have it too. Because um, there's a lot of warmth that comes out of those connections. And uh, some of that warmth really makes up for, as I said, these middle years of womanly stuff where I didn't do very much. You know, it's nice that they're there. So... I used to have busy years like that where I had my main job working usually in the hospital or something. And then I had uh, part-time jobs working for nonprofits in the community. So it might be like a uh, a home uh, program, like one of those programs that transition people to independent living. Um, I've worked with people with epilepsy, all sorts of populations, as they call them. I don't know if they still do, but back then there were different populations. So I'd work with a variety of different people. Um, I got to work uh, uh, supervising activity therapists in a forensic unit where women who were uh, put in a psychiatric unit to determine if they are capable of standing trial and uh, all sorts of interesting situations. And um, I, I enjoyed the journey. It exposed me to a lot and it showed me that uh, people have uh, problems much greater than any I might have. So it helped me put things in perspective. You know, a lot of people felt victimized by life and I was spared that because I got to see people who were truly yes. victimized by life. And nope, what, whatever difficulties I was experiencing were nowhere near that dire. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I want to just go back um uh, I'm free floating right now, but I want to tell you that I am working on a book and the book uh, that I'm working on currently ties into these 
uh, four years of college life. And um, the characters, what's incredible about these characters are that they are nothing like this friend of mine or myself or other girlfriends I had, yet the characters moved in almost immediately to dictate how what I was going to write. Mm -hmm. they, they really took no time. They just immediately, three of them appeared, and I spent a long time with those three. I actually took them through college, although I could go back and add more. I'm not sure I will. And then the next two appeared. This time there were two. And they are just, they've got me captured. I mean, they'll tie me up to a tree if I don't keep writing their stuff. You know, they're just, That's a good place to be. And uh, that is great. Those are, the, those are the books you sent me, right? No, those are not the ones. These are, those little books are to help girls with their mental health as oh, you send me some PDF files. So. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. when, I, when I finish, we'll talk about those. Uh, we'll, we'll devote a couple of shows to, to those. Yes, That's wonderful. Yes. Those, uh, you are absolutely right. And you got the first three, but um, almost nobody has read the uh, next two. And um, I am just like a little kid. It's almost like, you know, you're having your birthday party and your cousins really made it from Virginia and they walked into the room and it's like, these women are just waiting for me to do the next little thing that has to happen to them. So I find that really fascinating. Yes. And, that, and the human mind, you know, I mean, how, do, how, how is it that way? Are these really uh, characters I have developed or is this where the um, universe uh, floats things around and, you know, they've attached themselves to me, but that, you know, with in ways that we don't understand. That is worth doing several shows over. Uh, I bring th this uh, question up uh, fairly often. Uh, you've heard of Conan the Barbarian, right? Yeah. Well, the author of Conan the Barbarian was going through a dry spell, and he couldn't write anything, even though he was very uh, prolific. Uh, but he was going through a long dry spell. And then one day, as he sat by his typewriter, Conan the Barbarian appeared to him and threatened him <laughs> into writing about his life. So he wrote a bunch of stories that were dictated by this barbarian. That's or that's how he described it. Or that's how it felt to him, and that's what started the character of uh, Conan the Barbarian. Wow! Conan has outlived his author, and uh, there are, he has m numerous uh, portals to his life and adventures: uh, audio, video, video games, uh, cartoons, comic books, movies. So uh, uh, that's an example of what you're describing. Uh, and yes, as someone who writes, I, I can also say as well, sometimes it's this just has to be written and you're like an instrument and mm -hmm. everything seems too fully formed for it to have come out of your imagination or your head. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that is a spiritual, uh, you know, some something happening in the uh, uh, circles of, well, millions of people have lived and died and had thoughts and so on, and how are we still in, you know, perhaps attached to certain certain people in certain ways. I love how you're capturing the lives of women at various points in their incarnational journey. And uh, you're doing it through not just one particular lens, but you're, you have like, a lot of different lenses where you explore what it is to be a woman or female uh, in this uh, time. Uh, and you talked about now with old age, and I so I can see you writing a bunch of books about that as well. And that's a great gift, a great legacy. 
you know, to be leaving behind because uh, uh, it, it, it's again, you're not writing about superheroes. You're not uh, writing about wizards and warriors. You're writing about actual people living in actual times. Mm -hmm. You're getting into their heads uh, and whether through the uh, selfie uh, or through the books or now audio, um, you're allowing these lives to speak for themselves and to share the world through their perspective. And in collectively, it, how spectacular and how wonderful it is, um, you know, to be one of the characters in your stories, which are the stories of real people. I don't know how how well I explained that, but I think yes. it's just what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. I am happiest right now during the days when I can write some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I have even an hour and it works. It's a real present, a real gift. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm blessed with that. And anyway, we were... <laughs> The hour has slipped away once again. See that? We I knew we had an hour in us today. So, yeah. So um, I encourage people to look at resiliency as something you have plenty of and that you can have even more if you begin to think about it and use reasoning and good good faith attention to your own talents while you try to pull yourself up if a boss yelled at you or you lost a job or you're having trouble passing a course or your kid is driving you nuts. Try to remember that you have the resiliency in you. You just may need advice or help or some sort of advice on which road which road to take which path to walk on you know and uh you'll be back on your horse and to find your way you have to find what you're passionate about and stick to doing that uh, currently now professionally uh, i'm getting paid to do greek mythology <laughs> pretty much and uh, for kids, Greek mythology stories and adventures. For adults, uh, Greek mythology metaphysics and uh, psychological Greek mythology, like uh, the transpersonalists uh, have in Jung. Uh, and uh, th there's so much that I could do with Greek mythology. Uh, and it permeates my outer space uh, UFO studies. Uh, and that's my one significant passion and I'm looking for different ways of expressing it. And now I'm doing that almost exclusively. Wow. So it's possible. And uh, when Barbara first met me, I was a barbarian. And I was <laughs> wandering in the city of New York in fur and leather with a sword strapped to my back. And uh, uh, I used to do workshops on if I could do something with this, you who's... Uh, ideal might not be as uh, extreme as my own could certainly find something to do and i would show people how whatever they wanted to be you could start nothing's preventing you from starting and slowly you could build it into a business or find other people who are willing to pay for that and uh, there's no reason why you can't be whatever you dream of being beautiful i agree yes yes well, it was delightful being with you once again. Mm -hmm. And uh, till next month. How can people find you between now and next month? Yes. Well, the easiest way is enchantedself.com. I have a lot of stuff up there, not only about my books, but films that I've made and uh, all sorts of interviews and, and uh, stories and that's the best place. And if you want to write to me, write to me at barbara.holstein at gmail.com. And you're a web presence uh, in several different places. And if they Google you, they'll find a lot of the... Yes, they'll find, they'll find out stuff, a lot of stuff. And a lot of the stuff is, is there. I mean, a lot of my films are available. If you happen to have a Roku channel, there's a lot of stuff up on Roku. Um, so 
that's there. And I hope people uh, look for it. I'm delighted to talk to people. I encourage them to. There's a lot of wonderful things there. And you're a wonderful person. And I want to thank you for uh, being part of my life's adventure. You've certainly contributed a lot of positivity and deep thought uh, to it. And I, I, I really, really appreciate that, Barbara. And I look forward to our next conversation. I enjoyed this conversation very much. Me too. It was great. See you soon. See you soon. Be well. And this should be up by tomorrow afternoon. Okay, great. And you'll send it on to me. Too. Of course I'm... Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, Take good care. night, Barbara, and good night, everybody.